I've been at Microsoft about 13 years. The last about two and a half or three years has been in the Microsoft Research uh, Organization. Um, if Microsoft overall is a corporation of about 100,000 people, uh, the research division of uh, PhDs in computer science is about 900 people. Uh, of that, about half of those are located in Redmond. Half of them are located um, around the world in research sites and innovation centers. Um, Whereas I mentioned, most of those have PhDs in computer science and are working on longer term projects, you know, five, seven, ten year projects. Um, our team uh, is much more applied and much more focused. Uh, we are kind of looking more of time frames of uh, 12 months, 18 months, uh, 24 months in terms of uh, getting the projects out there. How we do that, and hence the name external research, is we don't do the research ourselves. We actually fund and partner with researchers outside of, um, outside of our company. So we will work with uh, the academy, we will work with uh, government agencies, uh, nonprofit, or in some cases, uh, maybe commercial publishers, et cetera, um, to um, develop technologies, uh, to develop functionality uh, that we think uh, uh, would um, benefit the community overall. And if there's some role that Microsoft can play in facilitating that, um, that process, uh, that's what we do. Um, that's enough of the commercial talk. The rest of it is going to be the um, observations that I've, I've made over the three years of, of, of working in this space. I'd also like to introduce Alex Wade, uh, my colleague from Microsoft Research. Uh, if the questions get really tough, you're gonna give them, I'm going to give them to him. <laughs> um, the themes that I, I would like to, uh, to touch on over the course of my talk um, will be obviously the, uh, the tsunami of, of, of data that is starting to overwhelm scholarship and um, the, the daunting, uh, daunting issues that that raises for the scholarly communication life cycle. Um, the concept of moving upstream, how, uh, how librarians, how publishers, uh, how um, 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 authors and individual researchers can really begin to move upstream and take more control over the process and um, thereby making it better further downstream. Um, I will look at that about how we can integrate uh, or how uh, the functionality that we need to surface out of the tools and out of the life cycle can be integrated into existing tools and existing workflows. Um, one of the huge themes uh, that our group likes to pursue in our work in, um, uh, in uh, the scholarly communication space is um, enabling semantic computing. So I'm going to talk about what that means and some examples that we've, uh, that we've noticed in the, uh, in the um, ecosystem. Um, one of the largest uh, themes that I will be touching on is the, the provision of services. I think this is the, this is the future of uh, scholarly communication. So we'll be talking about um, tools related to data analysis, to collaboration, and finally um, some um, kind of uh, interesting developments related to preservation and the capture and delivery provenance. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the, the uh, potential for cloud services. And then lastly, I'm going to make some comments that might get me fired back when I go home to Redmond, but we'll hopefully not. Um, the, um, I think the issue here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I think we're all aware of it. Um, you know, data-driven science, data-driven research uh, is an, 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 an unbelievable, uh, we have no idea. I think we can, we can talk about the numbers, but we literally haven't begun to uh, either, either calculate or really uh, we can envision it, but we haven't really done enough with it, and it's an, it's an unbelievable uh, uh, scale problem that, we, again, we can, uh, we can theorize around, but I don't think we've really tackled it at the scale that we're going to need to. Um, that said, computing is stepping up to uh, both create the problem and help us solve the problem. We're seeing uh, massive data sets. Um, which is raising the issue around the federation of those data sets, integration of those data sets, and, and collaboration of scholars in and across those. Um, the evolution of mid-core and multi-core computing um, is, again, like I said, uh, contributing to the problem, but is also going to be the way that we address the problem. And then there's the potential of the power of the client and the cloud, and how we'll be able to access this data, access this information anywhere and any time. Um, these are um, kind of the underpinning uh, of a lot of the solutions that I think we'll be, we'll be envisioning and that I'll be speaking about today. But to 
capture, to characterize the situation as it is now. Um, there is the ongoing need to collect this data. We've been, scientists have been collecting this data and have been, uh, you know, in some ways delivering it as part of the scholarly communication life cycle. But um, I don't think that the rest of the workflow over, you know, in the last three or 400 years or even in the last 20 or 30 years, we've been able to really take good advantage of that. What we are starting to see is this, this um, data processing and ana analysis and visualization. We're still in the, just the very, very early days of this. And then archiving, this is, you know, traditionally role of archives, of librarians, um, and it's been in a very paper-based form, and the, the, the mind reels at, um, at how we're going to address this uh, issue going forward. But um, this is a, a, a real, uh, as we would say, opportunity. These are issues, these are challenges, but these are also the ways that we need to solve and address uh, the problem. Um, again, to characterize uh, the, the issue, I'm going to touch upon a, a project. Uh, this is um, just some, some statistics um, from the Life Under Your Feet. Um, sorry, I'll move over to the side here. Sorry. Um, the Life Under Your Feet uh, project at Johns Hopkins. And this just gives you, I mean, this is, again, a, a drop in the bucket. This is just one example of a research project. Um, this has been, you know, there are, you know, arguably, you know, tens of thousands of these around the world. But it just gives you an idea. Uh, 200 wireless, uh, you know, computers, 10 sensors each. We're looking at, you know, um, something over 200 million measurements per year. This is a three-year project, et cetera. How do, they, how do they capture this? How do they maintain it? How do they curate this? How do they turn around and compare it with other like data sets around the world? How do they um, share that information, et cetera? Um, this is um, uh, a, a fantastic project. This is one of many, actually, that Microsoft is, is funding out of Microsoft Research to work exactly around data sharing, data collaboration, uh, and data curation. But it, just to give you an, an idea of the kind of magnitude of what we're looking at. Um, this raises the issue, um, and I, this is a, a fantastic, Joe Hellerstein uh, is a fantastic blogger, and I would highly recommend that you um, check out his blog, but this is a, a specific one there where he referred to as the commoditization of massive data analysis. And uh, you'll see, you know, he's, he's pointing out, and I've kind of highlighted some of the concepts, but I, I like the idea that he's touching on that we haven't even arrived at the, the industrial revolution of data yet. We have... Uh, we are in such early days, and as much as we think we're so advanced and we have all these tools and our resources, we're um, at the very, very, very early stages. And um, then I, as you can see on the slides, I ask a couple of rhetorical questions um, here. Um, you know, I'm not going to answer them. I wish I could, but I can guarantee that the answer to that is going to be yes. The, the, cloud, the cloud issue, is, that answer is going to be yes. Um, and then to characterize that problem, but then to put it in the, the aspect of what it, what it looks like to your, to your typical e-scientist or e-researcher, you've got obviously um, data coming from experiments and instruments. You've got um, data coming from other existing archives, pre-existing, searching the literature, pulling out um, data from simul simulations that are, might be based on the first two. And then you've got all the problems. And the amazing thing is, is right now, the individual research scientist or the individual lab is having to do and take on all of that. And um, on the other end, you might have the library um, or the archive or the, um, someone at some point in the, in the university or the organization who's in charge of the repository trying to receive this at some, uh, at some other point. This is an incredibly complex workflow and one that has grown uh, expansively in the last 20 years. And uh, we've all kind of tackled bits and parts of it, but uh, we've run into a handful of best practices, which we're going to be chatting about here. But um, there is um, an immense amount of opportunity, I will stress that word again, that's, that's happening in this space. Now, I mentioned the, the concept of moving upstream. Um, and this is, I think, uh, a very, uh, you know, I, I'm going to use the word opportunity about 400 times, I think. <laughs> but this is, um, uh, represents for us, um, for us, and I mean, I mean scholars, I mean researchers, I mean uh, corporations, I mean open access publishers, I mean librarians and archivists. There is an immense amount of work that needs to be done, but an immense amount, it's, it's an exciting time because there is kind of no, no baseline. There is um, only opportunity to, uh, to, to do that. And so I'm going to give you some examples of what I, what I mean, sorry, um, by moving upstream. Um, if there's an organizing metaphor that I would like to refer to, it's the research life cycle, or what I'll refer to as the scholarly communication life cycle. The, uh, the idea of collecting your data, doing your research, doing your analysis, moving to a phase of authoring where actually you've got your thesis and I'm going to write it down. Then there's the idea of sharing it, the need to publish and disseminate that. 
you might be blogging about your research results. You might be writing an article or writing a book or giving a paper at a professional conference. But in somehow making those first two steps public in a, in a, um, in a way to share it with your um, colleagues in the domain. And then ideally, moving to a phase where you store that and you make it, um, you archive it and you preserve it for future generations and, and for others. So if we think about these as four core sets of, the, of this life cycle, I'm going to add to that two other concepts. The need to collaborate, uh, and that is collaborating within and across those four core steps. And then um, additionally, the need for discovery, the need to search and find, for inf and find information within and across those sets. And so I just list this as a, uh, as a kind of an organizing metaphor. I think traditionally, from a, we'll say from a library and archives or, or curation point of view, this is typically where, I won't say where the process starts, but where libraries and archives spend most of their time. And I think where we need to really think about data curation is moving back up that life cycle. And that's why I mentioned the moving upstream concept. I think we need to be addressing a lot of these problems much earlier on. My observation is from working with kind of leading edge in, uh, innovators in e-science or e-research, uh, there are uh, the, the most forward thinkers in this space are people that realize that and are working very hard at data capture and data curation at the very early stages and worrying about um, how to capture that information, how to share it, uh, the protocols, uh, very, very carefully scripting that. And those are the people that we're trying to work with in terms of best practices. Um, and then being able to make sure that it moves throughout that entire life cycle, uh, that it's not just operating in, in silos. The trick there is integration. And how do we, as we move from step, from step to step, to be able to take not only the data, the, data, the metadata, and the provenance and ship that around? And this is, uh, this is you know, uh, and I, I, this is another point that I'll make um, later in the talk. It's very problematic. Sometimes there are domains that are very, very cohesive and very um, non-proprietary about their research. There are others that are uh, very proprietary. And being able to get uh, data curation standards and protocols in those specific domains can be very problematic. But it's very, I'd say, inherent on the data curators in uh, wh wherever stage they may be. Maybe it's publishers, maybe it's librarians, maybe it's people in the labs. Um, to be able to integrate and be able to move things from system to system uh, based on those protocols and based on interoperability. Um, so the interest from, uh, from my company's perspective is uh, how can we facilitate the move from what we would think of as you know, four or five hundred years of the scholarly article? How can we move from these very static summaries to much richer information vehicles? And so, you know, as you can see here, pace of science is picking up, status quo is being challenged, there are some innovators, there are some people that are, are dragging, but we maintain, and I'll provide some examples of uh, others in the ecosystem, that there is a, an immense amount that is available. And that's why I'm kind of pointing out the, you know, the, 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 um, the bottom below the surface. There's just a, a, an immense amount. If we can imagine that the container that is the scientific article that it has the ability to serve as and facilitate reproducible science. The ability to, when you get a paper, you also get the data, you also get a machine readable, we'll say, you know, methodology. That you're able to reproduce that methodology against your data set or uh, share your um, data set with someone else and let them utilize the methodology. Interactive data, the ability for you to take, pull out a table, change a figure, easily insert it back in and ship that document off. Or for you to be doing this on the web and not be thinking about a specific document, whether that be a PDF, a Word document, or something online in that way. The ability to collaborate, collaborate real time with other researchers. Dynamic documents that literally changing on the fly. Or the ability for reputation and influence to be, uh, to be captured, to be passed on, and shared. In the way, these are all the um, uh, themes that we're starting to see. We're starting to see resident in uh, examples. Um, again, uh, online, certain uh, commercial journals, open access journals are all starting to dabble with this. Um, a couple of points specific to that that I'd like to, to call out. Um, we're seeing interesting work, for instance, from uh, on the commercial side, Elsevier um, has been doing this article of the future competition. They also have a grand challenge that they issue every year. Um, these are producing some, some fascinating, fascinating ideas. I would, um, 
I'll be making this slide deck available, and these are live links. And if you're not familiar with these, these are um, annual. I think these are about two years old. Uh, and every year, these get a, a fair amount of attention. But uh, obviously, very scientific focus because it's Elsevier. But uh, amazing, uh, amazing ways that they're um, working within different domains to show how collaboration and how dissemination of information can work. Recently, I think this is probably about a month ago, as you might have heard, um, Public Library of Science Plus um, started a, a new, uh, I guess, channel for delivering information that they're referring to as currents. And uh, their specific focus was the H1N1 um, flu. And the, what they're doing, as you can see here, is it's fundamentally, it's, it is, um, how, do they, how do they phrase it? Uh, it does not go un in depth peer review. It's actually, the whole point here is not to drag things out through a six, 12, 18 month uh, peer review process, but to have a handful of experts in the field review it very quickly and get it out as quickly as possible. And this is a partnership between uh, NIH, PLOS, and uh, being published on Google, Google Knoll. And I think this is a fascinating thing. I think a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, journals would blanch the concept that this is uh, very uh, you know, uh, important scientific information that isn't receiving full peer review. Uh, and I think this is, uh, and that is not different from the Nature Proceedings work. This is basically a preprint uh, service that Nature, a publishing group, has been offering for uh, two and a half or three years. And I think these are uh, interesting in that, and I probably uh, represent uh, the future, in that you're starting to see uh, a chink in the armor of the peer review system that people are starting to say it's more important to get information out, even if maybe it's not the 99 or 100% solution, but if it is advancing the cause and advancing science, let's get it out there as, as quickly as possible. Um, another interesting that thing that's been announced over the last six or nine months that has um, uh, garnered, I think, a, a great deal of uh, interest is the Google Wave. And I myself haven't um, spent enough time on it, but watching the blogs and watching the people that we work with, there's a lot of interest into what this means. You know, time will tell us to how it, um, if we see adoption of Google Wave, but it, the, the opportunities for scholarly communication have been, um, have been heightened and some of the leaders and innovators in the field have jumped on this and what that could, what that could mean for uh, changes, um, especially when you talk about the commercial publishing world. And then lastly, uh, just another, another part of the chain is Mendeley, our, um, which is a, uh, uh, I think PC-based, and um, the papers, which is a Mac-based Mac application. Um, and, uh, you know, di many different people have referred to at least Mendeley, but papers as well as kind of the iTunes for academic papers, a way for you to download and store basically your own repository on your desktop of, of the papers that you're looking. And then it, you know, recommends, oh, if you're interested in these papers, you know, not unlike an Amazon recommender service, the ability. And this is uh, amazing, as you'll see. Uh, 60,000 people have already signed up, 4 million scientific papers have been uploaded, and that's doubling about every 10 weeks. So there, this is a, a small company that we actually chatted with a couple of times, probably six months ago, and they've, they've seen some amazing growth. So it's uh, some differing, uh, differing ways that you're seeing, uh, you know, peer, peer review being scaled back a little bit, uh, papers being distributed in different ways, not unlike maybe archive.org, et cetera, but um, new kind of new paradigms for how, this, uh, how information is being transferred within and across um, academic domains. Um, so that raises the point of, uh, yes, you know, how, how are we going to see uh, the, the world as we've known it for several hundred years around scholarly publishing? How are we going to see that change? And I, this is going to be um, in the world of um, open access, taking uh, a, a larger role, and the idea of paid and walled content starting to break down and go away. How are we? How are we going to see different entities um, continue to? Um, I will say derive value out of out of that content, and it's not going to be necessarily the content itself, uh, but it's going to be adding services on top of that. And there's many ways that we're going to see how that happens. Um, the, the benefit is we're now finally in a world where research is, is easily shareable. We're not talking about, you know, a uh, hundred pages of, of tables of statistics in the back of a journal from 1800. We're now able to, you know, send a spreadsheet or download something from a web service. So the data now is easily shareable um, uh, and interoperability is still a bit of an issue, but I think we're going to be tackling that. Um, from a, an interesting scenario uh, related to, to data sharing, um, many of you might be familiar with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. 
Um, this is um, some, some fantastic work um, by astronomers at many um, institutions and organizations around the world. But you can see that they've got three terabytes of uh, fully public information from 13 institutions, um, 500, uh, you know, uh, 300 million objects, et cetera. An amazing, an amazing job that these institutions have done to pull data from different sources, um, different formats, and pull it together and make it available in a consumable form. And on top of that, the amazing thing is you can see 350 million web hits in six years, and we have not, well, let's say, let's round up, a million distinct users versus a known population of, you know, astronomers worldwide of 10,000. So we're starting to see when you put this data out there and you put it in a consumable form, you're seeing much broader interest outside of the domain. It's fascinating to me. Um, the, the greatest example, and I, I point to Galaxy Zoo, is, um, you know, <clears throat> basically the mechanical Turk, Turk concept of making this data available and having people kind of drill down into it and care, help them, uh, have them um, classify different, uh, different aspects of it. This has received the Galaxy Zoo since it launched, I think about 18 or 20, 24 months ago. It's received a lot of um, publicity. There's been a lot of uh, uh, public access to this information. Over 100,000 people participating. The, the one that you may have heard of is, uh, I believe was a, uh, a, a Dutch homemaker who was, for some reason, looking at this, found an, a unique object, flagged it. Uh, it immediately got escalated to some of the most senior people involved in this. And it, was a, it was referred to as a blue object that they had not ever seen before. Um, based on that response, uh, they've actually, several months ago, turned to the Hubble or made sure to the, turn the Hubble telescope to look at that specific thing. And sure enough, this woman um, identified a, uh, an object that had never been heretofore uh, discovered. So it's an amazing concept of sharing that data and the possibilities for citizen science to, um, to help facilitate that, you know, do something that those 10,000 astronomers may not um, have been able to do for many, many years. Obviously, there are concerns with data sharing. Um, I think the astronomy community is uh, at the forefront in terms of making, making this information available, making it available beyond their domain. Um, but there is, it's an immense task for the integrating, uh, integrating it, uh, ensuring the interoperability among those data sets. Um, there's a challenge around annotating it, making, making sure that people can say, oh, wait, we need to look under this, or this is an anomaly, or this is great, or who did this? Basically, you know, again, kind of starting to touch on the, the next point there, provenance and the quality of the, of the data. And it's annotating it at, the, at a high level and a annotating it perhaps even at the, at the individual um, atomic data point level. level. Um, uh, exporting it and publishing it in agreed formats, again, kind of mapping back to the interoperability issue. Um, and then security. How do you share this? When do you share it? With whom do you share it? Um, these are all issues that I think in many domains have stopped people from doing data sharing, have stopped people, have, have forced communities to become proprietary. And I stress to you, I would look at the same list and say, these are the exactly the opportunity areas that will provide, uh, whether it be um, in libraries, um, institutions, whether it be commercial publishers, the people that are able to address these problems in clever ways are going to be the market uh, differentiators moving forward. And so these are exactly the areas that I would love to see institutions, I would love to see scholarly societies, I'd love to see libraries address these issues um, in, an, in an open and uh, interoperable way. Other services, um, data analysis. Um, I'm listing a handful of names here. Uh, Swivel, which is independent, um, uh, but uh, IBM's Mini Eyes, Google's Gapminder, Metabase's Freebase. There are many others. Some of these are kind of more um, on a different scale. But the idea in all of these is that these are open web-based services that are being made available. Some have kind of baseline services that are available for free, and if you want premium services, you have to subscribe at a, at a different level. But the idea that you can take in multiple data sets, and I mean, one example is to, you can, I would encourage you to go up to Swivel and look at the, the public data sets that people have loaded up. Again, provenance and security are issues, but for the ones that are up there, it's amazing the data mashups that you can, that you can create, or the free tools if you wanted to load your own data up and run it against yourself or your colleagues. These free services that are, that are now being made available. To me, again, these are fantastic tools that the academic, um, uh, academic uh, community could be using, could be using as models. Maybe you're not want to use this, but maybe you want to build services that are in a very similar vein. 
But um, I think these are um, tools that should, should certainly be um, should, should certainly be utilized. I, I personally have only used Mini Eyes for from, for textual analysis, and it's a fantastic fantastic tool. I'd recommend checking it out if you haven't already. But based on these tools, based on these things, we're really starting to see the publishing ecosystem shift. Um, and we are seeing um, uh, some of the scholarly, I'm sorry, some of the commercial publishers uh, investigating. And again, uh, things like the Elsevier Grand Challenge starting to say, hey, can you guys give us some ideas? And then, you know, m maybe we'll incubate, incubate that. Maybe we'll, um, you know, pursue some of these ideas. But we're definitely seeing publishers um, think about these, uh, these sorts of services. Um, I'm really interested, if you take a look at, a, at another, at another uh, world and you look at you know, the world that I'm very familiar with of, of software, you know, you've seen open source and you've seen IBM and Red Hat really build, not, they're not selling the code, but they're selling the services on top of the code. And this is, the, I think, a model that I think a lot of publishers are probably going to be looking at and, and adopting, the idea that, hey, the content can be free, but the services, that's where the value add, or that's where the differentiator, or that's where the, 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 the financial um, uh, enumeration might happen. Um, the other thing is this um, provides very uh, rapid prototyping. And so it, um, uh, especially if you're starting to not get concentrated or not focused on the peer review as we've traditionally known it, but the idea to build um, analytical services and visualization services, et cetera, allows very rapid prototyping and, and very unique things to happen. Um, and we can envision, and it's already starting to happen, days when repositories won't be um, simply the full text of research papers, but they'll be able to include and incorporate the great literature supporting around those papers, uh, data, images, maybe software, emulations, et cetera, that will support that. So that we need to evolve away from, again, just the, the traditional concept of the paper and think about all of the things, the, uh, the content in the paper and what it could represent. So um, I'm, you know, obviously I'm stating the obvious on the last point, but you know, to make all of this happen, some enhanced concepts of inter interoperability protocols are are very, very necessary. Um, a couple of examples uh, that I think is, uh, I think to, to illustrate the point, I'm very familiar with data.gov. Um, but there um, is it's fantastic to see that, you know, um, shortly after the new administration change, but there was this push within the government to say, you know, we've been, we've been collecting and we've been making this, this data available to ourselves for a long period of time. Hey, we, there's an there's a onus on, uh, on us to turn around and make it available uh, and, and uh, make it available to um, all the taxpayers. And so it's been fantastic to watch data.gov. Data uh, really take off and um, not unlike the the concept of you know swivel but we're starting to see some really baseline services delivered this way as well another idea that I like uh, quite a bit is um, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with but uh, worldwidescience.org and uh, this is a, a, an amalgamation of um, government agencies or other bodies in different worldwide uh, countries that are responsible for maintaining scientific and technical information uh, on the behalf of their country. So the participating, the types of groups that would be participating from the, uh, from the United States would be Department of Energy or, or NSF, et cetera. But a lot, uh, let's see if they have the number here. Uh, it's probably somewhere around 60 or 70 different countries that are participating. But they are pulling together all of their scientific information and, you know, again, in a kind of UN of scientific data, they're pulling all of this information together and providing a search, uh, a federated search across that. And I, I think this is fantastic because they're not going to publishers. It's, the, it's you know, it could be the British Library, it could be individual agencies, it could be uh, uh, scientific and technical information agencies in Korea and Russia, et cetera, that are getting together and, and doing this uh, regardless of borders, regardless of language, pulling together. I think this is a fantastic model, and it's something where you know certain institutions are saying we'll worry about the data curation, other ones are saying we're going to worry about the crawling and the indexing, and they're dividing and conquering and tackling it um, again, kind of in a, in a UN fashion. It's fantastic to see a lot has happened in this space over, just literally over the last um, two to three years. So um, I, this is something I think is a, a fantastic model to, to emulate. Now the concept of um, enabling semantic computing is an interesting one. Um, the tough thing is people have been talking about semantics and semantic computing for years, and we still 
are talking about it. We're still not kind of feeling the benefit of it. I'm one of the people that has kind of jumped the chasm and definitely feel like there's going to be extreme benefit for us in the long run. Um, and so a lot of the, uh, the efforts that um, happen within our uh, group, our research group at Microsoft, are focused on enabling this. Um, but it still might be a while before the kind of rank and file um, are able to uh, enjoy the benefits of what we're going to see in this, in this space. Um, pointing to another, another blogger, um, Cameron Alon from, uh, uh, from the UK, um, he has a, a blog called Science in the Open. And um, I, I, love, I love the highlights here where he says, the laboratory record is reduced to a feed which describes the relationships between samples, procedure, uh, procedures, and data. Stressing the point that, yeah, the data is great, but the, the next step is understanding the relationships between the data and the relationships between the data and the paper and the methodology and the, and the co-authors that are written and the expansion of linked data out from the individual atomic data points. Um, and then he points out what it also requires is good plugins, applications, and services to help people generate the lab record feed. It also requires a minimal and arbitrary sensible way of describing the relationships. Again, here's the opportunity. We're, again, stepping away from simply the paper and starting to think about the data and how we can enable that. And by the, the whole promise, and I think I'll probably skip ahead to the next slide, the whole promise that this, that this represents is the, you know, the ability of um, tagging and identifying these relationships and letting machines generate this intelligence, this artificial intelligence that is... Uh, things that we, uh, our, you know, our minds will not be able to capture, but only uh, via high, high performance computing will we be able to see this. And I want to stress that there's a distinction between semantic technologies and the semantic web. Um, semantic web is, you know, one of the many tools at our disposal, but there are semantic, um, semantic based solutions that have to be out, um, operationalized at much lower levels. That's just kind of one manifestation or one channel that we will see. So, <clears throat> how do we start to arrive? How do we take advantage of these things? So yes, there's the idea of leveraging collective intelligence. There is, you know, at, the, at, a, at a very simple way, there's the concepts of these recommender systems, last, last FM, or when you're buying something on Amazon, yes, you know, other people who bought this also bought. That's, that's you know, brain dead in a lot of ways in comparison to the benefit or the promise of semantic computing. And so we're starting, you know, there are applications of these recommender systems, Conatea, Biomed Central's Faculty of a Thousand, but by comparison, these are, these are very manual. They're not literally manual, but they're very still kind of peer review based or some kind of basic social networking. But there is the idea of this automated uh, correlation of scientific data and um, smart composition of services and functionality, the idea that things that we would have never been able to, to compute or think about on our, on, on our own, if we're able to describe those, describe those uh, relationships between things and let the computers do that, do the, the, the connections, uh, we're you know, in a, gonna be in a much better space when these things are realized. Uh, the, the other point that I'd like to stress here is that we're not all gonna have supercomputers under our desk to do these things. And in the, in the, in the near term, uh, I, I uh, envision and I think very strongly that we're gonna be um, as an as a, as a academic community leveraging cloud computing more and more. Um, uh, we see a lot of usage uh, going around the world. We see a lot of usage. Uh, yes, it's, it's great, and scientists all would like to have um, uh, massive computing powers. A lot of them are starting to use things like Amazon um, uh, EC2. Uh, our um, Amazon S3 to store their information or to do their um, to do their calculations, uh, and I think that that is uh, a model that you know it's um, going to um, ramp up quite a bit. So, kind of reiterating the, the last point, you know, in a world where um, all data is linked, and this is uh, uh, the linkdata.org um, kind of the, an ever evolving. Uh, uh, world, uh, sorry, diagram of, of linked data. I, it's, it's very much worth a visit to that to that site. Um, there's an immense amount of uh, of potential, but it, when we have that, when we have the ability to demonstrate and catalog these uh, these networks, you can imagine when everything is stored, processed, and analyzed in the cloud, the kind of services that can that can just be automatically generated. Knowledge management, knowledge discovery. Uh, you know, virtualization, storage services, 
notification of uh, it, you can you can easily start to capitalize on especially if you're not focused on the storage and the compute if you're able to kind of basically offshore or out, outsource that and you're able to focus on delivering these services um, I think it's again a much greater value add for our respective roles whether it be um, as uh, as authors as scientists as librarians as archivists mm -hmm. some form or fashion when we talk about cloud computing, just for a, a point of distinction, uh, you know, many people have kind of broken into three three categories. This is actually from Tim O'Reilly, but the idea of kind of very baseline infrastructure, utility computing, moving up a level to platform and platform as a service. And there's examples of uh, Salesforce.com, Google's App Engine, many things in that in that area. And then finally, um, the thing that I think we're most all familiar with, the idea of, of software, end-user applications, things like Facebook, things like Search, Amazon, et cetera. Um, but these would be the, you know, the three levels. And what I was mentioning earlier is I think this is for most of us uh, in, in the scholarly communication or research world, we would love to be able to not worry about those and spend our time in this area. So this is, this is the opportunity space. And I think this isn't a very, very obvious concept, but why would we want to do this um, so we don't all have to have a supercomputer sitting under our desk? But there are many reasons that, would, um, that are going to lead us to cloud computing. Um, and it just, again, takes um, a huge chunk of, uh, of you know, time, resources, uh, and effort off of the table and allows us to think of much higher value add uh, services. Um, certainly, the cloud landscape is still developing, but you to get an idea of the services that, that are already out there, and we may not even think about them as cloud services, but the idea of Flickr, of SmugMug, et cetera, for, for photos, um, for video, obviously we know about uh, YouTube. Uh, how many people are familiar with SciVe? Handful, four or five. SciVe is basically YouTube for scientists. And the idea of, um, and it's, a, it's free, it was actually NSF funded, came out of uh, UC San Diego, but it's the idea of, you know what, I've got a 75-page physics paper, and I really don't want to read it. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. But instead of reading the abstract or the entire paper, why don't I go and watch an, uh, the author who actually did it do a 10 or 5 or 7-minute video that explains the concepts and maybe actually demonstrates. There's another, another similar thing called um, uh, Jove, the Journal of Vis Visualized Experiments. And it's an amazing, again, an amazing use that is really kind of a, a layer above the, uh, above the article. Could also save a lot of money traveling to conferences if you want to. If you want to just uh, take a look at these things online, I, I'll jump back to Smug Mug for a second. How many people are familiar with Smug Mug? So only three or four. The the amazing thing about Smug Mug is it's Flickr, but they own no infrastructure. They are completely utilizing uh, Amazon SC3 and EC2, um, and so it, they have zero IT infrastructure. And so they've built their entire business on top of Amazon, which is a risk, but I think in a lot of ways that they're a very forward-thinking company and that they're saying we're, we're just going to take that part of the equation off the table and we're going to worry about doing added, you know, more value-added services. Obviously, the other ones include SlideShare for presentations, Google Docs for word processing, spreadsheets. We're seeing a lot of these end-user tools that are already available in the cloud, um, but you know, in a certain way, these only go a certain, uh, to a certain degree, and it's not, maybe not the last mile for what, um, for what scholars and for what researchers need. And I think that there's a gulf there that is, again, an opportunity for people to step in and begin to take advantage of these resources and build those um, compelling and value-added services in the middle. I mentioned um, Amazon's S3 and EC2. Um, I'm going to skip over the DuraCloud project because I'm going to have a slide on that in a moment. But the idea that we could start leveraging these resources um, to do the hard aspects of, um, of archiving and preservation that have heretofore been very difficult and we've kind of prevented us from doing it, these things are starting to get to be a lot easier. And then there's the idea of, of new mi business models that are developing in this space. Um, service provision could be a new way to sustainability for some, for some journals or from, for some societies. Um, I'm also interested to see the NSF uh, data net solicitation. Uh, they're actually in round two, doing a second round of solicitation. These are uh, $20 million four-year four grants that are be being given not to one institution, but uh, coalitions of institutions that are coming together. Um, in the first round, it was um, Johns Hopkins and probably about eight or ten partners uh, got um, awarded the first one as well as... Um, 
was it, I'm trying to remember if it was Oak Ridge and University of New Mexico, but those are the two first awardees. But the idea behind these is saying, okay, all of the problems I've been talking about around collecting data, storing data, and preserving it to make sure that the scientific data is available, NSF said, we realize this is a problem, and we're going to get groups of not just individual institutions, but groups of uh, institutions together with a specific mandate, A, to create sustainable digital preservation solutions and something that they have to turn around and make available. So they have to actually produce something, not just a prototype, but something that can be turned around and shared with the community. Um, and there, I know NSF is in the second round of awards um, for that uh, at present. But it's, uh, to me, it's a, very, uh, it's a very interesting evolution in thinking that these aren't based around actually developing new data. It's taking existing data and data moving forward. And how do we preserve that and, and ensure that it's going to be around? And the mandate is on these is to say, not just it's a four-year grant and your, run, your funding runs out, but there's a goal, a stated goal of the thing that this, these have to be sustainable and you have to build a business model for how these will continue after the initial four-year grant. Um, then, uh, preservation and provenance. The, um, I mentioned the DuraCloud project. Um, this is, uh, for those of you that are familiar with uh, DSpace, uh, Fedora, they actually merged, uh, in, there was over two separate uh, open source software repository packages. They actually merged uh, into a single entity about six months ago, uh, which is, they're now referred to as DuraSpace. And they are initiating a project that is called DuraCloud. And this is the idea that uh, at the, I will say at the, at the top level here, um, you might have hundreds, thousands, in fact, you know, we are probably talking somewhere between two and 3,000 institutional or, or centralized repositories around the world, um, several here on the Harvard campus, several over at MIT, et cetera, um, but, you know, two or 3,000 of these worldwide. And right now, <clears throat> they don't have a very good, you know, backup or plan B or plan C in terms of how they're preserving that data. Some, some are experimenting, but in terms of how could, they, uh, how could they scale this or how could they really address this in a much larger um, uh, uh, order or fashion. And so what uh, the Dura, DuraSpace team has done is they went to the Mellon Foundation and said, we would like to build a business, a, a scalable, large-scale business around preserving information at these academic institutions for these institutional repositories. And so what DuraCloud will be doing is providing this area, providing this durable um, storage, uh, sorry, durable storage service layer. And, and then, so they would basically, you know, let's take the Dash repository here at Harvard. Dash could go to DuraCloud and say, I would like to sign a service level agreement with you. I will have a local store of my, of my data, but then I will store a backup or store a mirror with you. And then what DuraCloud does is turn around and they go to HP, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, whoever, and they sign and they are able to distribute and share multiple copies at different locations, et cetera. So there's two agreements that are going on, but it's, I think it's a fantastic, this is the best application I can think of in terms of cloud computing and preservation. And it's a, it's just, it's a large scale. This is something that, uh, I, you know, I know the DuraCloud people are talking with everyone. We hope to be one of the pr providers behind the scenes as well, but I just think this is a brilliant approach. And obviously, Institutions will be paying for this service, will be funded in that way, and these services will, be, um, will uh, attract um, this kind of ecosystem as well. Um, another blogger, John Wilbanks, um, from his Science Commons blog, um, I think raises an interesting point that I will, be, I will be closing on. We need more than computer software, routers, and fiber to share scientific information more efficiently. We need a legal and policy infrastructure that supports better yet reward sharing. And so the point that I close on here, and I, I stress that you, rec that, you, that you read more of his blog, but um, this is uh, what I hope doesn't get me fired back at Redmond. But at the end of the day, it's not, it's not exclusively software. Yes, I've been talking about the opportunity, et cetera. But it's, as we all know, uh, I wish I could say, I've got the answer, and here it is, X, Y, Z. But at the end of the day, it's making sure that people are participating in this, that we can encourage, that we can provide incentives and rewards uh, that we can perhaps revisit what peer review looks like or what the tenure process looks like. These are things that have to change, that have to evolve. And it's going to be different in every domain. It's going to be different from institution to institution. But at the end of the day, 
you know, as much as I'm as a software vendor, the much as much as I can say, I'd love for there to be some code that we could write that would address the situation. But at the end, it's a sociological <laughs> issue that has to be addressed as well. It's it's a, it's a, a key part um, of that equation. So. I will point you, this is the, the last little tiny bit of a commercial, but this is just a, a, a website uh, that describes um, some of the work that we're doing at Microsoft Research, just research.microsoft.com. Um, and then lastly, I will just share my information, my email contact, and a website about the specific uh, area um, that, we, that we work with. So um, I would like to open it up to questions. Um, there might be uh, questions coming in from the Twitter feed. Um, Thank you very much. I, before we start, I just yes. want to add that we, have a, we actually have a global network of people who are also watching this live. They're willing to watch it afterwards. And just if they want to submit their questions to the website, the PM website, we will definitely get back to them from you afterwards. OK. And I'll, we can certainly make the slide deck available as well. Great. Okay. Thanks. That's fine. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, and again, some of it's happening already. I, I, you know, I had a couple of a couple of the examples. You know, the Elsevier Plus, very interesting things. And it's just a matter of um, these are. You know, I, I look at Plus as a very forward-thinking organization, Public Library of Science, um, and it just has to be an, an issue of are the domains. You know, they are a leading edge, but and an innovator, but the domains have to kind of latch on and start. Uh, taking it and running with it. Another example is, you know, Google Wave. Fascinating potential, but it's been tossed out there, and it remains to be seen if communities are going to adopt it. In a lot of ways, you know, you, you look at, you know, you, you know, domains like astronomy or physics or chemistry, you know, very guild-like, you know, kind of old school. And you know, some you have some innovators and some laggards, and it's just going to be interesting when we can see like a, a tipping point happen in, in certain areas. And you know, the oh, I feel like. The onus is on the, the people in this room, the people in these institutions, to say, how do we lead them you know, across that chasm? What are the compelling you know, rewards or incentives or services that we can provide to say, don't do it the old way, do it the new way? So I, I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I could say when, but I think it's, it's going to vary from domain to domain, from institution to institution. Yes? Yes. And saying, well, we can build an embedded tool widget that people can use to analyze government data in the context of lots of the political discussions right, right. online. And, they, they're, and they're pretty sophisticated about it, right? So they want to bubble it up. And so I wonder what will bubble up from the mass culture you know, right. that develops online where intelligent people are talking about, about data? And what will come down, in a sense, from institutions? that, you know, NSF cyber infrastructure right. kind of right. thing. Yeah, so uh, I think quickly characterize the questions. When, how, if we look at the consumer space, what um, implications or what examples could we start seeing kind of bleeding over into the, into the academic or, 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 or uh, public sector in that way? Um, I think it's a, a, an amazing uh, space to watch. I, I think I, I tried to list a couple, I think, examples like SciVe. Um, like SlideShare, et cetera. There are certain things that SciVe where you can say, okay, well, yes, there's YouTube, but how do we build a special application of that for scientists? We see a little of that. Um, and again, uh, I think the consumer space is a fantastic, it, it's interesting, you know, you used to th kind of think of uh, the consumers, I'm um, sorry, the business space maybe influencing the consumer space, and we've seen a complete reverse of that, and we're seeing a lot of things bubble up from there and applied uh, in a, in, uh, to the academic world there, or to the, to the private sector world there. Um, I, I'm trying to think of, you know, other examples that I've seen, and uh, again, it all depends on, and from my, from my perspective, it all depends on when that gets adopted by the leading, the leading people in the field, the innovators in the field, and if they can, you know, you know kind of jump that chasm and make it uh, more broadly, broadly useful um, or broadly applicable. So it, it, it's, uh, it varies. <laughs> I, I, I just, I, there, there are certainly examples of it, um, you know, 
smug mug, etc. There are things like that, but yes. So I do want to ask a question. To, to, okay. So um, when proselytizing internally at Microsoft, yes. what do you see as the issues that need to be overcome there, if any? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. And um, how's it going? Yeah. Um, so um, whereas you know, 50% of my job is talking externally, um, or I should characterize that as by talking some and trying to listen more, um, to your point, the rest of our job is going back inside the company and acting as a conduit, acting as an advocate for the higher education space overall. And whether that be from a teaching and learning and education space or a research and scholarly communication space, um, myself, Alex, others in, in the external research group are literally your advocates to turn around and, and, and try to make the case, make the business case within the company. And so th that's our job. Uh, in, inside the company. And so what we've done over the course of the existence of our, our specific group over the last three years is exactly come out to venues like this, sit in meetings, a, a, attend academic conferences, listen, hear what the pain points are, uh, hear, find out what the innovators are doing, whether it's on our software, whether it's on open source software, whether it's on com um, competitive software, but turn around and go back into the product group and say, guys, Look to kind of to your point. Look what these leading people are doing, or look what this is. Look what is happening in the uh, in the um, consumer space, and look at what we can do inside Word with SQL, with SharePoint, etc. Oh, okay. So um, that's a whole different presentation. I mean, we are we, um, it, it, and we had a, another meeting on campus where we did a little bit of that the, this morning. So yes, we are building. We probably built six or eight add-ins uh, for, for Microsoft Office that facilitate chemical drawing, semantic markup, um, writing, uh, writing um, academic articles, um, uh, the consumption of ontologies in, in, in journals, uh, and our, I should say in Word documents. We built a, a tool for facilitating collaboration on top of SharePoint that facilitates collaboration among scientists and academics. Um, uh, we built a repository software uh, platform that uh, allows people to to build um, uh, to build repositories. The, uh, just you know, I would recommend that you maybe check out the website. It's Microsoft.com/scholarlycom, and that will take you to the list of the products that the projects that we've that we've produced. And that's, and that's our group, uh, much larger than one of the things I think that made maybe bigger impact was that we just recently announced an open source foundation, uh, as separate from Microsoft, called the CodeFlex Foundation. And that really unlocks a lot of things that was blocking Microsoft in the past. We're actually able to contribute to open source projects now. We just contributed uh, 25,000 lines of code to the Linux kernel for driver support. So there were things that even where philosophically people were, were turning around at Microsoft, there were things that we could not do. And now we're able to do that. So it's taken. A lot more to be said, but I'm, you probably get the idea. Yes? yes uh, it's more common than a question. But here at Harvard, the Institute for Quantitative Social Science, we, we have developed an end user application actually that uh, addresses all the concerns that you listed uh, in the data sharing. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, it adds uh, the uh, data analysis for tabular data, mostly social science for tabular data, but uh, for network data, for social network data. Um, I, I'll just be very interested in uh, showing uh, you. Yeah, uh, because it has a lot of the. Uh, but it goes through all the all the issues that you have posted here, and we try to address one by one. And besides, one, one thing that it has been well uh, discussed as about how people actually adopt it afterwards, right? Is that so? It's just not only the software providing this as a service that uh, I mean, software, software is open, open source, is free to have data. But the main thing that has helped to adopt it uh, across researchers across the world has been to uh, give ownership of the, well, at least provide a, the perception of ownership of the data. So they create their own site, they upload it there, we take care of all the archiving, uh, provide all the services to their site, but they can configure completely their site, it's basically the Facebook of research data. That sounds like a fantastic best practice. <laughs> so I, I definitely want to talk to you, and I'd like to have a slide about the work that you guys are doing. So it's fantastic. 
Oh, please, let's follow up. Is it called Dataverse? Yes, it's the Dataverse, yeah. And the developers are here. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Other questions? Yes. Um, when I was going through, um, uh, many of your examples were um, data sets right? and science yes. with data sets. Yes. And data is sort of agnostic. But once data is used and um, papers are written, I was wondering how, the, I mean, Elsevier is doing something, but how published texts uh, were going to, were they going to keep up with data sets? Were things going to be developed for them? But now it sounds like you are developing things for written texts mm -hmm. and actually authoring the texts. Yes. So, I mean, there's, there's many ways of thinking about it. So a lot of the work that we, our group is doing is how can we take documents that are written in a, in a Word file, traditionally, how can we evolve that? How can we, you know, capture that in XML? How can we embed data sets and images, et cetera, in that and send that document around? How can we semantically mark up? How can we in, in, include information? That's one idea, right? And that, so these are some of the experiments we're doing. Other, some of the things I've talked about is how can you say, we're not going to worry about PDFs, we're not going to worry about Word docs, how can we do it on the web? Things like Google Wave, things about, um, you know, just the representation of, on, on HTML. There's places that are saying we don't need to think about these old containers anymore, we can do it in a virtual way on, 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 the, on the web. And so there's those, and those are some of the other areas of exploration. We want to be able to look and observe at, at all of those. Uh, one of the ideas And are you providing a way to do that? I mean, or yes. are you addressing that? Yes, well, like in part, yes. In and part, again, yes. we're doing, you know, we're doing, we're, again, taking the tools that people are most familiar with, which is one approach of saying for, you know, in certain areas, Word is our PowerPoint or Excel, very common tool for authoring or capturing information. In those areas, we're trying to build ways to allow scholars or allow researchers to define those relationships, to import ontologies, mark up the document, define those, uh, define those relationships, and share that maybe with a repository or with a database or with a publisher when they submit that. So yes, we are doing that. There's other examples of the, the work that we're doing where we've, the research uh, output repository platform that we built is taking advantage of that and doing the calculations and the linking and the semantic calculations to, to pull those and document those relationships. So there's, there's, there's examples um, that we're doing and as well as other organizations. And, and, and partnering with other organizations yeah. coming up with ways to the relationships so we're not, we're not right. set out and come up with Yeah, I'll stress that. We're, as much as I'd say, woo, it'd be great if micro you did everything on Microsoft, we know that that's not going to happen. And so our main focus is to say when and if you use Microsoft software, we want to make sure that it's uh, not a hindrance, but it facilitates your interaction. If you, we want, if you put data into it, you get the same data out or better data out of that uh, in that process. So that's, that's the kind of uh, effort that we're doing in Microsoft Research. Yes. I have a quick question. Um, What's the latest developments in terms of how data is being tagged or marked up semantically, um, sort of automatically on the fly as it's generated? Because a lot of the times it seems like there's this curation step. Scientists take like an Excel spreadsheet from their whatever it is and then put it into the computer and then eventually it ends up sort of tagged. Um, but it seems like really before this will take off, the machine doing the measurement really has to know how to tag it. Mm -hmm. What's going on with that? Um, uh, you can give it to him. Wait, no, no. <laughs> An excellent idea. So, <laughs> I would, I would actually one idea. So, I would not feel uh, uh, um, there are basically machines that are doing blogging, right, and that are able to, you know, put thing out. You're able to do the tagging of that information that's coming off, feeding into a certain place, and it's being tagged automatically. Those, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not experiencing that. I don't have enough background there. How what we are doing within Microsoft, I can talk a little bit about. Actually, I can point to Alex, and I would mention the Kim for Word. I mean, how are we doing the semantic markup and the data in the? We have built an, an add-in uh, that facilitates chemical authoring and, and semantic markup for chemistry. Yeah, and, that, and that's definitely part of it. I mean, it's uh, it's within the authoring environment. The, the, the two examples that I think are most interesting right now. There's multiple examples of this, but. Uh, the, the chemistry group at Southampton University has all of their instruments measuring uh, 
environmental variables, measuring machine outputs, every, every single thing that somebody was had, having to record in a lab notebook is all being recorded for them, being output directly to the blog. So when you go and record your experiment, you say, I was in this room at this time, and you're effectively creating a data mashup between your lab notebook and what the room is telling you what went on. Is that where Cameron Nalen is? Yes, is that yes. Yeah, exactly, so, exactly right. Um, when you move into the, into the sort of automatic step, uh, there's a group at the uh, Oxford Research Center that's doing some work in, uh, in the cancer research space that is allowing uh, researchers to semantically annotate within the Excel environment. So instead of just having a column in a row and you don't know if it's, you, know, you may be able to tell its temperature, but you don't know if it's Fahrenheit or Celsius, or you know that it's a, an instrument that was recorded in this particular uh, uh, stream of data, you, the underlying XML of that Excel spreadsheet now is annotated pointing to an ontology that says this experiment was used, this is how the data was gathered, this is the units that it's in. So that then when you upload it, there's no further processing. You, you, you have another format that that goes into another system that's all, that's all carried along. The units data. problem really seems like a tricky part that's on of the world. That's fine. Thanks. Sir. Uh, another example to, to look at in terms of, I would take best practice in, in, uh, in data curation is the fluxnet.org, yeah. and that is um, it's something like a, what, 100 different organizations worldwide that are all calculating or, or capturing uh, water, uh, water hydration data from around the world, and working in a cooperative, single framework to you know capture that information and share it. It's a great story about non proprietary sharing of information, uh, you know, duration, curation across data sets, etc. Yes. We're increasingly blurring the lines between what I traditionally consider scholarly information and a wide range of other kinds of information, or maybe expanding the definition of what we think of as scholarly information. The traditional role of libraries, because there's a few of us in the room, is to select, collect, and preserve what we determine to be or think is scholarly information or scholarly information. What's your impression of what the role is of the libraries as <laughs> so, um, for full disclosure, I'm, I'm actually a, my history is as an academic librarian. So I was at I was at Columbia University for years. My they kicked exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, then they made me go to Microsoft. But um, I, and to your point, uh, my opinion, uh, I think that the safe the safe world of collecting books and collecting scholar I'm sorry, collecting scholarly journals. Um, it's been done. We figured it out. Yeah, yeah, we can we can kind of figure out you know how to how do we get from 98 percent to uh, 99 or 100 percent. But that's not the problem, and that's not where we're going to make the difference moving forward. It is data curation. It is provision of services. It is working directly with publishers or going around publishers and working directly with the scholars and saying let's do. Conceptually, it may have been done. It still takes an enormous amount of energy and money. Absolutely. To do that. Exactly. Right. I, no argument, but I would argue that that is taken as read. We, uh, that is not. I mean, it still has to happen. It needs to happen behind the scenes. We are going to make the most incremental impact. Is all of the you know I hate to, what traditionally has been either you know gray literature or the stuff that's been underneath the desk or on the on the shelves of the scientists. That's the stuff that's unique and that needs the brain power. What, what uh, librarians and archivists have done for centuries, we've figured out we need to apply those skills to a new set of data. And that's, that's my opinion. And, and I'm a former librarian too, so I can be, I can be heretical. But I, I, I mean, I Once you, a librarian. Yes. <laughs> you, can, you can divide it up into the curatorial and preservation aspects yeah. of the work, or you can, you can uh, look at the side of the, the actual scholarship, the further scholarship. And those are two separate avenues and extremely uh, difficult uh, areas to tackle. But to Lee's upstream uh, analogy here, I think I think that the big opportunity and the big place that that the profession needs to go is to get into the laboratory, needs to be with the researcher, needs to be when applications are being written to solve a problem. A lot of the times, it's not being written with an eye to how the information comes out of the system. Right. So scientists create problems for themselves that then need to be solved. Are they are, are, they, are they create they create a solution that makes sense for other scientists, but maybe won't cross a domain or won't make it easily available for, right. for other populations that might be interested in that data. Yeah. And I think that's a value that librarians have been able to provide. Uh, thank you. Yes. Great talk. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, 
I want to probe a little bit your, uh, what you alluded to at the end, the uh, sociological uh, shape that might need to take place. And uh, I've worked with scientists for, I'm not very into it, but with scientists uh, for more than 10 years. My impression is it's not uh, generally a sharing culture. Right. There was a piece in the Onion now, several months ago, that says selfish scientists won't share data. Wasn't too far off the That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, when reality and yeah. You know, so I'm wondering if it's going to take. I mean, I mean that may be true of uh, you know older, older generation. I mean, gen the general generational thing is blurring. You know, with social networks like Facebook and Twitter, but um, well, we can't wait. But um, you know, I, I wonder if the, sh the shift it's going to take. It's going to take a generation for all this to sort of sort of sort of sort itself out. Because younger people coming in, you know, they're used to blogs, they're used to communicating a lot, they're used to being not very private. But um, you know, for example, in the market research, you know. Two market researchers may not want to share things you know, among themselves because they're competing um, with their products. So yeah. um, I can see some cultures where it may make sense, and other cultures where there's going to be a ton of resistance. Yeah. Um, again, I'm, I wish I had a canonical answer for you. The, the answer is there's a broad scale, and it's going to vary you know, from domain to domain. It's going to vary even within the domain. There's going to be innovators. There's going to be laggards. Um, are we going to have to wait a generation? In some cases, yes. In other cases, I don't think so. I think we've, we've seen, I've seen, witnessed, you know, in the last five or ten years, tremendous shifts uh, external to Microsoft. Um, let's, let's, pick, uh, let's pick open source software. Um, three, well, let's we'll say five years ago, there's no way the work that we're doing now would have been supported within Microsoft. And Microsoft has started to go, hmm, wait a minute, we need to think about markets in a different way. We need to engage with different communities in different ways. To a point now, we've created an open source foundation. There are parts of the company that are generating a lot of open source. And again, if you would have said to me 10 years ago, is Microsoft going to be thinking that way? I would have said never. And, and some of the most you know, um, you know, proprietary thinking people in the company have now completely shifted. And so that kind of, that kind of opportunity, that kind of potential reward um, is, I think, the, the incentive that we need to be able to demonstrate to, to scientists and to say, okay, you've been very proprietary about it, but if you can point to examples of where sharing actually helped um, you know, a colleague or something else, uh, some other type of situation, vastly improve a colleague's career or, you know what I'm saying? Or, or, it's, or helps you. I mean, the problem, yeah. the reason people don't share their data is because they, they run a, a process, run an experiment, and they, in their mind, have six papers out of it. And as soon as you share your data, you're opening it up to the world and you're hurting yourself. If the reward system was such that by sharing your data, that is also recognized as part of your contributions, then there's more incentive to do that. And, so, the, other, and the other side of it, I think, that you're talking about addressing is if it's incredibly hard, no one wants to do it. If, it. if there's so many roadblocks and so many hurdles to sharing that sharing that data or making it talked with other data, um, then they're definitely not going to do it. But if you can create systems uh, that facilitate that and make it ridiculously easy or even 5% easier than it is now, then that might be the incentive. So. Yeah, and the, the one way to also give uh, credit to the, to the science that shares the data is by creating the data citations, uh, yes. we, we provided them uh, the one, way of, of, uh, yeah, one way of for all uh, researchers to uh, well, sure. understand what they, uh, well, to get credit for what they do is have the number of citations, so the number that they've been cited writing journals, so if the data can be cited, too, yeah, that's an additional one Sounds like we should all be talking to her. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I I, I will go back to the, uh, I think it's related to your question and the upstream data services and the role of libraries. Let's imagine I give you a uh, beautiful young mind of a library and you can mold it into any way. What skills would you put in there? What, because we all hear that um, that's necessary. But is this a computer scientist that we're talking about? Is it a hybrid between information expert of some sort, computer scientist, and a scientist in this subject, and you can describe the right. person. Um, so, it, it, very interesting. I'm not going to be able to sit here and say, here's the 15 things you need to do with, I'll, I'll talk about, I mentioned the data net, um, the data net um, solicitation that NSF put out. And so that's basically pulling together um, scientists, it's pulling together librarians and archivists, it's pulling together, in some cases, um, businesses. And um, it occurred to me that that would be an amazing, you could, if you could teach a class on what those guys are doing. And so I actually 
um, Alex and I are both affiliated with the Information School at the University of Washington. And I've explained to them about, I don't think you need to be training librarians the way we need to be training them. We need to start thinking about a service orientation and not, and not reference interviews, but how do we start saying you need to build services, you need to be build value added um, uh, services on top of the on top of the data, and it's literally I think to your point I think it's getting them some classes over uh, in in the business school. It's getting some exposure to policy and legal in other areas. It's sitting down with the informatics groups, chem informatics or bioinformatics, and getting these partnerships, uh, multidisciplinary partnerships across departments. Um, and I think that's uh, you know the, the way that it, it has to go. I mean everything is bleeding into. Um, to uh, you know, kind of multidisciplinary work, but I get as a librarian, I get a little frustrated when I go into a place and it's not a librarian doing the work, but it's a chemist doing the work. The chemist who you know got his PhD in chemistry is now doing work that I would traditionally think and suspect a librarian or an information professional should be doing, and I feel like that's a failing on our profession, uh, where the where the you know the scientific domains have had to spill over into traditional things that librarians should be doing. And I think it's, a, it's the onus is on the, the information schools to reclaim and, and in partnership, not, not in a competitive way, but to say, no, we, we're experts in doing that and all these other experiences, now we need to do it in, in your area as well. There's a lot that librarians have learned over you know, a couple of centuries that we need to apply in those, in those other areas. So we have time for one more question. Yes. Uh, I just want to follow up with the question he talked about. Uh, and notice your Microsoft policy, internal policy, you put more and more information on your application code or your you know, application design online and share with others, like you know, before you know Microsoft sell everything for money. Um, have you, in your company, see the advantage or benefits yet uh, after you put more and more information internal or your application code online or more and more on where, uh, where? Have you seen the benefits yet? Uh, I wish I could say something like, yeah, we've seen, you know, word usage spike or SharePoint license. No, we, we are, the reason we're doing this in, in many ways, the reason that Microsoft, specifically Microsoft Research, is doing this work, um, most academic institutions around the world have already licensed Microsoft software. You've already paid for it. The institution has already bought it. It may not be used. Uh, it may not be used by, uh, by various departments or various people for various reasons. And what we're trying to say is, if you didn't know this functionality exists, it does. Or if it doesn't exist or it's not meeting your needs, let us help you know, make sure that it does. And we can either build that or we can give your feedback to the product group and ensure that that is additional functionality. So what we're, fundamentally, we're not trying to say, hey, it's, we've had a great benefit for Microsoft. We're trying to say, we want you to have the benefit because you've already, literally, your institutions have already purchased the software. We want to make sure that you deploy it and have a positive experience doing that. And it helps you get your job, your job done. And, and again, as a point that I made a little bit earlier, it's not that we want everyone to run, well, again, yes, that'd be ideal. We'd love to have everyone run you know, Microsoft software all the time, but we know that that's probably not a reality. Specifically, when we get into you know, um, specific domain applications, we want to make sure that in that ecosystem, that Microsoft's you know, interoperable, that you can get data in and out, that we can you know, play friendly and, um, and, and be, part of that, be part of that ecosystem in a, in a uh, positive fashion. Okay, thank you, Lee. Thank you.